Hello and welcome to this Australian BioCommons webinar on getting started with command line bioinformatics. My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Australian BioCommons Training and Communications Officer. I'll also be your host for today's webinar. This webinar is part of a series in which we, in which we share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools available to the life sciences community. Each month we hear from our national and international peers on a bioinformatics topic that we hope will help Australian researchers achieve their best agricultural, environmental and medical research. You can keep in touch with Australian Biocommons via our webpage and by signing up to our newsletter. You can also follow us on Twitter and check out our videos on YouTube. Before we begin today's webinar, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. For me in Brisbane, this is, this is the Turrbal and Yogara people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Paris Brandes, who is a doctoral candidate at the School of Life and Environmental Sciences at the University of Sydney. With a background in genetics and a passion for animals, Paris's research focuses on how genomic data can be used to help conserve some of Australia's most threatened species. Throughout her PhD, Paris has harnessed the power of the command line in both traditional HPC and cloud environments for her genomic analyses, and now aims to assist and inspire others who are starting on the same journey. Welcome to the webinar, Paris, and I'll now hand over to you. Thanks for that, Melissa. I'll just share my screen with you all. So um, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for attending this webinar. I hope it will be really useful for a lot of you. Um, this webinar is based on my 10 simple rules paper that I wrote with my supervisor towards the end of my PhD. Uh, and basically this paper just summarizes a lot of the useful tips and tricks that I learned throughout my PhD, um, basically going from no experience in uh, command line or, or coding or computation or really bioinformatics in general, um, to now using the command line pretty much every single day full time. Um, so it is a bit of a steep learning curve and there's a couple of little tricks that I think really help you when you're first starting out some background knowledge that is kind of absent from a lot of the different tutorials or, or tool um, documentation. And so I hope um, today's webinar and this paper will be helpful for any of you who might be starting on that same journey with command line bioinformatics. So these are the 10 simple rules that I will be presenting today. Um, we'll go through each of them um, sort of in a chronological order. I've tried to put them in order as best as I can. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to go into too much detail into each of these uh, rules. I could probably do a webinar on each different one, um, but please refer to the paper if you have any, um, or if you want to go into more detail, um, but hopefully the most important information I'll try and present today. Um, something I just wanted to mention as well, um, because I didn't come from an IT background, some of my definitions and things are quite simplistic um, because I want them to be friendly for beginners. Um, but just keep that in mind that um, some of the things I say might be a little oversimplified for those of you who are more kind of technologically advanced. Um, but I hope that um, at any level you still get something out of uh, today's session. So let's get into the first rule. And this has got to do with um, computing terminology. So when you first start with your uh, command line journey, um, you will likely come across a lot of these different terms that you may have never seen before, or you may have seen before, but weren't really sure what they mean. Um, my first piece of advice is to really take the time to understand what these terms are, what they mean, and how they affect your workloads that you're running. One of the mistakes I made when I first started using the command line is I had an idea of what these terms meant, but I didn't really understand how they worked 100%. And so I was guessing a lot of the time as to uh, what you know, errors might be meaning. Um, I would be guessing kind of how much RAM I might need or CPUs I might need. And so having an understanding of really how they work and, and what they do will help you um, when you're running your workloads on the command line. And so I don't have time to go through each of these definitions today. There are some kind of simple definitions in the paper, but I wanna go through some of the main uh, kind of structural um, features of compute. Um, because that's what I'll be talking about throughout this webinar. There'll be a couple of terms that I refer to. 
So when we're talking about um, computers um, and the command line, um, these are some of the basic components that you might come across. So in blue here, we have a node. Um, and you can think of a node, I guess, as a, a kind of separate computer um, or kind of a separate machine. And nodes are composed of both CPUs or cores. So these words are interchangeable. Uh, they both kind of mean the same thing. And also RAM, which is random access memory. And so um, the CPUs um, or the cores are the chips that are actually doing the computation on that node or that computer. Um, and then the RAM is kind of where all the important information is being stored while those computations are taking place. So each of the CPUs or cores can access this uh, memory um, while they're doing the computation. And so something um, to mention is this is kind of a, a standard um, ratio of uh, RAM to cores. So here we have 32 cores and then we have 128 gigabytes of RAM, which is about four gigabytes of RAM per core. So there are these kind of standard proportions, um, but of course there's multiple different um, ways you can set up your CPUs and RAM. So for example, on your laptop that you might be watching this on, you'd probably have a, a, quite a few less CPUs and quite a lot less RAM on that machine. Um, but you can also have different configurations like this high memory node over here, where you have fewer CPUs, but you have a lot more memory. So the ratio of memory to cores um, is quite a lot bigger. And so this is important to know because when you're talking about traditional high performance computing environments, which you might have at your local institution, or you might have available to you through national infrastructure, um, these high performance um, clusters will have a number of different nodes. So they might have 80 of these standard nodes and say 10 of these high memory nodes. So it's important to understand how they're set up and what nodes they have available to you. Similarly, when you're um, selecting a machine, if you're using cloud computing or if you're buying a server to sit under your own desk, um, you will need to decide what kind of setup you want. Is that kind of this standard uh, proportion um, or a high memory sort of computer? Um, and you can decide on what uh, setup you need when you're running cloud um, machines as well. So it's just important to understand what this means, how they work and what the setup really looks like and what workloads might work best on these different uh, setups. So for example, if you're working with genome assembly, you might need something with really high memory so it can store all the bits and pieces and sequences while it's assembling it all together. But it's something like simple, um, like Blast, for example, um, can run across multiple CPUs, but doesn't need too much memory. So it might be uh, more suitable to something with uh, that lower proportion. Something else that I thought was really important to mention as well is multi-threading. Um, so you'll probably come across this as soon as you start working with any command line programs. So a single threaded program, which is, I guess, kind of like a standard program. Um, if you have four processes, each one run one, run one after the other um, on a, just a single CPU or core. Um, and then the output is uh, processed just from that single core. So this works well, but obviously it's not super efficient because each process has to wait for the previous one to finish before it can run. You also have multi-threaded programs where you have the same uh, four processes, but this time it's been kind of coded in a way where you can run each process on a single um, CPU or core and then the output can be merged together. So this is obviously a lot more efficient because they can all be running simultaneously, um, which will obviously reduce the time that this program is running for. And so usually when you think about a thread, just think one thread is equal to one CPU or one core. Um, this is a little bit simplistic because there are some newer technologies where you can run two threads on a single core, but just to keep it easy on you know, most machines, one thread is equal to one CPU or one core. And so if you know how many cores you have available, you therefore know how many threads you can run. And usually when you're running a command, you have to specify how many threads it, you plan on running it on. Um, it's usually one of the parameters that you have to specify. So knowing what cores are available or what cores you've asked for then helps you determine how many threads you can run it on as well. So that's really important. Okay, on to rule number two. So this has got to do with tool and pipeline selection. So once you've understood your computing um, kind of background and these definitions, um, it's important to then figure out what kind of tool or workflow or pipeline you might want to run for your analysis. And this can be one of the, the trickiest components because there's so many tools and bioinformatic workflows out there. Um, and so you really need to know your data and assess your needs before you select a given tool. And there's a couple of ways um, you can do that. So first of all, look at your target species and your, your quality of data. 
Some tools might work better for large organisms with large genomes, while others might work better for small genomes. Some might work with polyploid uh, genomes, while others diploid. Um, so really understand your species, understand your quality of data and what kind of programs might handle your data quality a bit better, and also your type of data. So are you working with long reads? Are you working, working with short reads? Um, and can your uh, tool use those different types of reads? Um, also, you have to assess what computing resources are available to you. Some tools or pipelines might have very demanding computing resources and you might not have access to that kind of um, computing infrastructure. Um, and so you might want to look at another tool. Um, or there might be some comparisons available where you can see which tool might work most efficiently. Um, so it's important just to think about that as well. And then finally, are there any tested or available tools um, that you already have available to you. So for example, if you have access to a high performance computing um, cluster, are there any tools that are already installed and that have been tested by other users? Uh, is there anyone in your, else in your lab or in your um, kind of close um, group within your kind of niche area that have worked with certain tools and have had good success? Um, that's really important too, because they've probably done the hard work of testing it and making sure it works and understanding the compute requirements so they can help you out. So it's really good to look at the tool documentation, um, see what they uh, recommend if they've tested on different species, look at the tool publication, also look at any papers that have cited that tool to see what species they've run it on, what data types, um, what kind of accuracy they got from the results, that kind of thing. Definitely talk with your colleagues and see if they've run similar kind of uh, workflows before and what's worked for them and what hasn't. And also you can uh, take advantage of online uh, Q&A forums like Biostars. Um, most of the time people in bioinformatics have probably asked a very similar question to you. Um, so having a look through there is really helpful. And if not, you can post your own question and others in the same field might be able to answer it for you. Something I wanted to mention when I'm talking about tools that are already available to you is the Biocommons have been working to create this online um, tool um, under the Australian Biocommons website. Uh, which basically lists all these different really common uh, tools that are uh, available um, or that a lot of people seem to use in the community and it will tell you whereabouts these tools are installed um, so for example are they on galaxy are they on nci the national compute infrastructure um, some of the other um, computational infrastructure we have in australia are they available as bio tools or bio containers and kind of what versions um, are available as well uh, it also tells you what the purpose of the tool is, so you can easily use the search bar to filter for different tools if you're after something to do with sequence assembly or population genomics. It's just a really handy tool, especially um, if you're an Australian researcher, to see whereabouts these, these tools might already be installed and if they're available on something that you have access to. Number three is estimating resources. So um, once you have your tool in mind, you then need to estimate how many resources it's going to need to, to run. And again, there's a couple of different ways you can do this. You can look at the tool documentation and any test data sets they provide to just get an idea. Does it multi-thread? Does it use a lot of memory? That kind of thing. Also, again, look at the tool publication and any cited papers. They might have some summaries of the computational requirements that um, they used for their species. And again, ask colleagues and use online Q&A forums if um, you know, that kind of information will be helpful to you and if you have people you can talk to. Um, and online Q&A forums are really good for reaching out to the wider community as well. Um, in general, this is the setup that I tend to use. Keep in mind that I work with large genomes, so mammalian species. Um, and I found that this kind of setup works really well for the majority of the larger genomic pipelines that I'm running, like genome assembly, transcriptome assembly, that kind of thing. Um, but of course, some programs will need a lot less than this and some programs might need a lot more than this. But I just wanted to give a general kind of setup that I kind of uh, go by at first if I have no idea what the compute requirements are. Um, again, I just wanted to mention the Australian Biocommons have also been working on some tool documentation for common uh, kind of complex workflows like genome assembly. Um, and they've created this documentation to help other researchers that might be needing to do the same kind of workflows. So for example, this is one that I helped them with, which was for the improved, improved phased assembler pipeline, which is for assembling PacBio HiFi data. 
Um, and so this just goes through a tutorial of how to install it on your given infrastructure. There's some um, template scripts that tell you kind of the, a guide of computing resources and the commands that you can use. So definitely check that out and see if any of the tools that you might be wanting to work with um, have already been documented within the community. Number four is selecting platforms. And so once you know what your requirements are, you then need to select where you're going to run it. Um, so some um, workflows might need a high memory node, for example, or a high memory machine. And so you end up coming to the um, decision of whether you want to use something like a shared high performance computer, if you have one available to you, or the cloud. Um, and I know cloud is becoming a bigger thing in research, so I did just want to mention it today. And here are some of the differences. So in the cloud, um, the computing resources are customized, meaning you basically select what kind of machine you want to create. Um, you select something with a number of CPUs and an amount of RAM, and it gets um, kind of built for you, and then you can change it as you need. Whereas on shared infrastructure, the computing resources are usually fixed, so they have a given amount of nodes of a certain size, and you kind of have to adhere to those resources. Um, there is some flexibility if they do have different size nodes, though, which is good. In the cloud, it's also an unshared resource, meaning that no one else has access to those um, machines or whatever you've built. Um, you're the sole owner of it, so you can type in commands directly via the command line um, and kind of set up your environment exactly as you need it. On shared HPC, shared HPC platforms, it is a shared resource, so everyone else is using it as well. So you have to schedule jobs. You have to submit a, a job that will get put into a queue and then it will run once it's your turn. In the cloud, you also have complete control of your environment. So you're responsible for installing your software, making sure everything's set up correctly, um, which can be both a blessing and a curse. It's a bit of a learning curve, but it is really um, nice to have that feeling where you can just do whatever you, whatever you want on it. Um, with shared HPC platforms, the compute is uh, the compute environment is largely controlled by IT. So you will usually have to submit a ticket for certain software to be installed. Um, there is a lot of things you can do yourself, but of course, because it's a shared resource, you don't have as many kind of rights or privileges um, as you would with your own machine. And then finally, with the cloud, there are both free and paid commercial options. Um, by free, I mean um, options that are available to researchers either based on merit or based on your institution. Uh, if you're a researcher within Australia and commercial is um, kind of the typical Amazon, Microsoft, Google platforms that you pay for as you use the compute. And then sh uh, for shared high performance computing, it's usually freely available based on your institution or merit schemes as well. Um, so it just depends what, what you have um, and what institution uh, you're affiliated with. I did want to mention if you're thinking about um, cloud, uh, you're not really sure how to get started with it, um, but you think it might work. It's, it is really good for, for genomic uh, workflows, I've found. Um, definitely check out Ronan. Um, I've been working with them all throughout my PhD. Um, and basically they simplify cloud for researchers so you can take advantage of the power of kind of having all these different uh, machines um, at your fingertips. Number five is software installation. So you've decided where you want to run your uh, pipeline or workflow and now you need to check whether the software is installed and if not, you need to install it yourself. Uh, like I said, with most shared high performance computing infrastructure, usually IT will do this for you, but it's still good to have an idea about how software is installed just in case there's any errors that you might be able to kind of fix yourself. So there's a couple of different methods. The first is using default package managers. So for example, APT on Debian type systems like Ubuntu or Linux machines and also YUM if you're using a Red Hat um, type distribution. Uh, what these do is they have like a list of common software. You can run APT install last plus um, and it will install that program for you. It will install all the dependencies. It will configure it for you and it will make sure it's available to you. So a very simple process, but of course it is limited with how many different packages are available. So the next step up from that is Conda. And Conda is also a package manager, but you have to install it on the machine yourself, or it might already be installed on your HPC. Um, and Conda has this channel called Bioconda, which I think has, uh, I think it might be over 7,000 different bioinformatic packages that are available. And similarly, you can install packages with Conda install and then the package name, um, and it will take care of all the tricky parts for you. Um, you can also manage different environments in Conda to keep programs separate from one another if they might conflict with one another, which is really good as well. You also have containers, which is the next step up. And this not only installs the software, but it also installs kind of the whole operating system. So it's really good for having 
um, consistent code or versions and things across different computing platforms, but they can get a little bit tricky because you have to uh, know kind of where your files are stored. Is it on the local system or is it on in the container? How do you move data back and forth? Um, so it does take a little bit more getting used to. Um, Docker is kind of more for single machines, while Singularity is really good for HPC systems. And then finally, if you have no other option, you can manually install software yourself. And this is usually composed of four different steps uh, where you download and unpack the code. Um, you then configure the software, make sure it has all the required dependencies. Um, you then build the software, which creates the actual executables or commands that you run. And then you install the software, which basically makes sure it's available to you whenever you log into that terminal. So the um, tool documentation will usually go through this process for you step by step, so it's not too hard to follow. Number six is script curation. So once you have your software installed, you then want to write your script that you're going to run. Um, and any bioinformatician will know um, the feeling of when you have a script and you've made some silly error um, and you go back and look and you've spelled a file name wrong or you've specified a path incorrectly or there's a folder that you've specified that doesn't exist. All these little errors will get you along the way and that's why it's really important to carefully curate and test your scripts. What I mean by that is make sure that there aren't any little syntax or minor scripting errors like file name issues um, or missing directories. Um, also check, make sure that your software is installed correctly and that you can access the command. Uh, make sure that there's no dependency issues so everything has been configured correctly and it's not going to go looking for something that's not there. Uh, and also try and um, make sure your compute resources are sufficient. Um, if you don't give it anywhere near enough, it probably will error um, right at the start at some point and just tell you that um, it doesn't have the right amount of resources. Um, or sometimes it won't even give you an error. Um, so it's important to kind of check what resources it's using, which is one of the next rules coming up. Something I did want to mention is that when you're working with high performance computing environments, um, interactive queues are your friend when it comes to testing your scripts. So obviously in the cloud, or if you have your own machine, you can just test your command straight through the command line and it will come up with any errors straight away that you can fix. But in shared HPC environments, because you're submitting a, a job to the queue, um, the worst thing is if you submit it to the queue and then finally it runs and then it comes back and you've made an error, a little error that could have been fixed. Um, and the way that you can kind of get around this is you can launch an interactive queue which is basically where you log into one of the nodes with a limited amount of resources and you can just run your command there um, and it will test for things like you know, incorrect file names straight away or um, not being able to find your software and that kind of thing. Um, so it just gives you a little bit more confidence when you submit your job that it probably will, lo will work. Um, there can still be errors further down the track um, once you, your job's running, but at least those initial errors, you would have already caught them with the interactive queue. Number seven is monitoring and optimization. So this is really important, making sure that you're running things as efficiently as possible. And to do that, you need to monitor your pipelines. So in the cloud, you can use a program called HTOP, which is just a command which shows at that point in time what's running on your machine. So how many CPUs are being used, how much RAM is being used. If you want more extensive kind of resource, resource monitoring, you can install NetData, which I use all the time. This gives you access to hundreds of pre-configured pretty graphs um, to let you have a look at different metrics on your compute um, across a certain period of time. And I'll show you some screenshots of these in a second. And then on the HPC, it's a little bit different, but you usually will use the scheduler logs to see um, how your job ran. Um, and you'll get a summary of the maximum and, and total resources used, which you can then use to adjust future scripts. So this is what uh, HTOP looks like. As you can see, all these green bars are the different uh, CPUs on the machine. So this is a really big machine. It's got 96 CPUs. And you can see they're all being used to almost 100%, which is what we like to see. It's being used very efficiently. Um, the memory, however, we're only using 71 gigs of about 748 gigs. So if this memory continued to be quite low, I'd probably change it to a machine with a lower amount of memory just because I'm not using it all. And these are commands that are being run. So you can see here, I was repeat um, masking a genome. This is one of the example graphs from NetData. And this is again, uh, looking at RAM. So green is what's available. Uh, red is what has been used and blue is what has been cached. So again, you can see if this was across my whole pipeline, there's a lot of free RAM. So I could probably move this to a smaller machine um, and make sure I'm kind of saving costs and running things as efficiently as I can. On a HPC scheduler, you'll get back a log that looks something like this. 
you can see in blue I requested 12 hours of wall time, 12 CPUs and 96 gigabytes of RAM. And in the log, it shows that I used uh, three hours of wall time, 12 CPUs, which is good, and 49 gigabytes of RAM. So next time I ran the script, I'd probably adjust it to have a lower amount of wall time and a lower amount of rem memory, um, which means it can probably run a bit quicker because it can be slotted in a bit better. As for optimization, what I mean by that is you can use things like GNU Parallel to make sure you're running things efficiently. So for example, if you have a for loop in your script, instead of running one sample or one file at a time, why not run them all in parallel on different CPUs or cores? And you can do that really easily with this program called GNU Parallel. So highly recommend looking into that. And also it's good to do some tests of CPU versus wall time. So a lot of programs, as you increase the number of CPUs or threads, um, your wall time will decrease. Um, so it will run more quickly, but usually gets up to a certain point where it kind of tapers off a little bit. And understanding where the kind of optimal balance between CPUs and wall time is, is um, really important, especially for workflows you're running um, quite regularly. Uh, so I recommend doing a couple of little tests just to see how um, that graph looks. Rule number eight has to do with file manipulation. And uh, I really recommend for manipulating files to get familiar with some basic bash commands. Um, and these are programs that are by default installed on most command lines. So one of these is grep. And what grep does is it allows you to match patterns in your file. Um, these commands are really good because when you're working with big genomic files, you usually can't open them in Excel if they're too big. And so you will need to kind of filter the output yourself or um, extract different information using the command line. Um, so grep's really good. Uh, this is an example here where you can grep chromosome five and it will print all lines that contain chromosome five. So you can kind of use it to subset information. We also have awk, which is probably my favorite little command line program. Um, awk super powerful. It works on um, column based data. So you can see here in this example, we're saying if column one equals to five, print columns two and three. So that's just a very basic example, but it just shows you uh, what you can do with awk. You can um, search for strings as well. You can add columns up, you can average columns. Uh, there's so many things you can do with awk. And then finally, we have SED, which is a find and replace program. So you can see here we're replacing sample one with this ID number. Um, so it's great for little things like that. Uh, and the great thing is you can combine all of these together into one long command and kind of do step by step filtering and data manipulation as you need. Uh, rule number nine is record keeping. So make sure you write everything down and keep really good notes um, and well formatted notes are, are key as well. So there's a couple of different programs I recommend. First of all, Lab Archives, a lot of um, institutions in Australia have now joined Lab Archives, and it's basically an online note-taking uh, kind of web application where you can write your notes, you can link code to notes, you can link files to notes, uh, you can share them, you can search them. Uh, it's really, really great just for all lab activities, not just coding uh, or scripting. Uh, if you don't have Lab Archives, I highly recommend Evernote, um, which is another note-taking program. It's free, there is a paid subscription if you, if you need those options. Um, but again, it just keeps your notes really well organized. You can add little code snippets in, um, so it's all nicely formatted. I also highly recommend having a good script editor. So Visual Studio Code or Atom are two of kind of the most favorite ones. Um, both of these have heaps of cool features where you can automatically format your code, um, make it look really nice. It can give you little hints about different commands. Um, there's just loads of uh, functionality that's really good if you're scripting a lot. Uh, Git is version control of your code. It is a bit of a learning curve, but it's really important, especially when you start working on big projects that you might be adding to and editing a lot. It's good to have different versions you can revert back to if needed. And finally, Markdown is something that I use a lot. Um, it's kind of a markup language where you can quite easily make headings and add in code snippets and type notes and it will format it in a way that can easily be shared to GitHub or um, created as a PDF to share to other people. So it's really good for tutorials and just keeping track of your notes. Finally, rule number 10 is uh, patience. You need to be patient um, when you are running bioinformatics uh, workloads. There will always be some new error or some new hurdle that you come across as you're um, working on the command line. Um, but the feeling at the end when you've converted all of your data into something that's really biological meaningful um, is worth it all. But yeah, so patience is key. Make sure you be patient and it will all be worth it um, at the end. 
Um, so thank you all for um, listening to this webinar today. There's some time for question and answer now. This is the QR code for the, the paper if you want to read a little bit more about each of these rules. I'm sorry I had to go through them a little bit quickly. Um, but if there's anything you really want to discuss more or kind of dive deeper on, please feel free to reach out to me as well. Um, I love sharing any of this knowledge that I've has kind of helped me throughout my PhD and should help other beginners as well. Thanks very much, Paris. We do indeed have time for questions now. Maybe I can start with the question, Paris. So there's a lot to take in there, I think, and a lot for people to learn. What are some of the resources that you recommend people start with, for example, in learning some of those bash commands? Yeah, so there's um, tons of great kind of online tutorials, um, especially for those bash commands where you can um, kind of play around with some example data um, and go through and practice um, kind of subsetting that data and extracting information from that data. Um, so yeah, definitely take advantage of any of those free um, kind of online training modules that they have. Um, also, the best way to do it is just to practice yourself. So if you have a text file, uh, maybe just make it a little text file uh, that might look like the, the final one that you'll be using and just have a play at um, having a look at some of the commands um, and how they work and how you can kind of manipulate it to get it to the, the point that you, you need it um, for your final output. Uh, the best way definitely is, is just practice. Um, and I should say that, I, you know, there are times where creating your own Python or Perl script might be more effective. Um, but I did learn Python right at the start when I started doing all this bioinformatics because I thought I probably would need it a lot. Um, but those three kind of bash commands that I talked about earlier um, really kind of helped me get through everything. Um, even without needing Python, I could do pretty much everything I needed to do just with those three little commands. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. We have a question that's just come in through the Q&A panel. And the question is, uh, what do you do when a new version of the tool is released? And when should you rerun past data or transition to updated versions? Do you have any hints well, and tips on that? That's a, that's a good question. Usually if there's a new version released, I'll have a look and I'll see what's changed in that version. So they'll usually have a little summary of the changes they've made with the new version that's been released. Um, and so I'll have a look and see what's changed. I'll see if any of those differences um, kind of will make a difference to my analysis if there's any new features that will really help um, with my workflow, make, might make it more accurate or might have a new option um, that will help. Um, if not, I'll probably just stick with the same version um, that I've been running previously just because it's already installed and configured the way I like it. Um, but if the new version does have some improvements you want to use, um, then I do recommend um, kind of updating to that version and, and using that. A lot of the time new versions will have um, improvements um, in accuracy or, or even speed of the program. Um, so it's worth it um, sometimes just for those kind of added benefits, um, just to improve the speed of your analysis. I guess that might also depend on how far through your project you are as well. If you're quite close to the end of your project, you, you may not want to go back and reanalyze anything with a new version. Um, yes. in, in that case, it's then more about being transparent and, and keeping those, that documentation that you were talking about of which version you've used and why. Yes, exactly. Yeah, documentation is, is really key, um, especially because sometimes versions will change um, how the command is written. So they might change how you specify a certain flag or parameter. Um, and so if you try to run that code again later with a different program, it might not work. Um, so keeping a track of what versions you use is really important. So another question, this one is from Christina, who's part of the BioCommons team, and she says it's a great intro to getting started. And she'd love to know just how far you've had to come in your own journey and what are you doing in your current research? Sure. Um, so, yeah, it was a big learning curve having not come from any kind of background in um, IT or computing. Um, even just understanding computers at you know this new level you know what do cpus do what do what does ram do what does it all mean um it was a steep learning curve um but i think it was so worthwhile because um as most of you know who are probably on on this webinar we're starting to bring in loads more genomic data these days because it's becoming so much more affordable and 
um, kind of more achievable for a lot of lab groups. Um, and so having the, the ability to, to use the command line and work with that data, those really large data sets um, is really useful. And so it's worth taking that leap into bioinformatics and um, it's not for everyone. Some people don't like being at their computer all day, but um, I, I've always loved working with computers and technology. So um, I do quite enjoy it. Um, and it's led me to, to all different areas, like cloud computing was something that I only kind of vaguely heard about right at the start of my PhD, and now I use cloud computing on a, a daily basis. Um, and yeah, there's, there's just so much out there to learn and to help you, so definitely take full advantage of it. And if I can do it, um, I feel like anyone can, so... So this question is, uh, what's your experience using Docker and what is your advice on catching up with it quickly? And the same with NextFlow if you've used it. So this question is relating to containers, I guess, and, and deploying them on the different systems that you're using. Yeah, sure. So I have worked with Docker a little bit before. Um, Docker, it can be a little bit tricky to get started with. Like I said, it's a bit difficult to understand um, how to interact with the container and make sure your files are in the right place and you're transferring files to and from Docker. Um, but it can be really helpful um, because you can always deploy that same container again in future. Um, so I think with Docker, definitely taking advantage of um, online tutorials as well for that is really helpful. And especially if you know a colleague who works with Docker as well, um, sometimes that can be really useful because they can tell you any little tips of how to make your life easier when you're using containers. Um, something that really helped me as well is I went to actually one of these seminars, uh, webinars for building containers um, and learning how to actually build it then really helps you understand how to use them and how to run your own software through those containers. Um, so having a kind of general understanding of how they're created um, is useful as well. Um, Nextflow, I haven't used too often. There's been a couple of workflows that have used um, those kind of uh, things like Nextflow or Snake Make, those kind of things. Um, they can be really, really helpful, um, especially if you have a lot of different tools that you're connecting together into one big analysis. Um, but again, that's kind of another learning curve on top of just running them separately. It's then putting them all together and making sure they interact with each other properly and that you're getting the correct input and output files. Um, so I think, yeah, definitely, um, I would say definitely get it working as its separate components first. And then once you have those separate components working, you can then try and put them together using Nextflow or one of those um, kind of um, programs to, to help you in future run it a bit more quickly and efficiently. And if you are interested in learning more about containers, the Poise Supercomputing Centre has a series of webinars and online materials that you can have a look at as well. That's I think that's probably the, the session that you attended Paris is one yeah. of those. Yeah. So another question that's come in here is when learning command line, did you try to understand the program and the process first, for example, through uh, graphical user interfaces and then convert it to the command line? Or did you try to master generic basics first and then focus on the science method afterwards? Uh, that's a good question. I think, I think it really depends on the program. So some programs like, for example, Blast, um, there's a lot of those um, graphical interfaces that you can use um, to blast kind of small jobs. And it's helpful for understanding the process and kind of the outputs that you get from that, which can then help you run the program on the command line because you sort of already know what's involved. Um, but for other programs that, um, you know, might not have that option of a, a graphical interface, um, I think it is good to, to really get right into the command line itself. Um, read through the, the manual of that tool is really important um, and just see how the commands are kind of structured. Um, that's probably something I should have mentioned earlier as well. When you're starting to use the command line, um, it's really important to understand how commands are written and why they're written in certain ways. Um, how you use flags, what, what they mean, how they affect your workload. Um, so really taking the time to read the tool documentation, seeing what options are available and if they might affect your data, what the default kind of values are and if they will work for your uh, data or species, um, that's really helpful as well. Um, so I think, I think web interfaces um, can be quite good um, as a transition if they're available. 
Um, but if not, um, I think it, it's still fine to jump straight into the command line and, and start working it out from there. I think no matter which, if you're using command line or web interfaces, it's still important to understand um, what you're trying to achieve with those processes. So, so for example, I used to work on RNA-seq and when I started to try and learn to do that with the command line, it was really important for me to understand what I was trying to do with each step. I didn't need to understand how I was doing it, but I needed to know that, okay, this step is aligning it and then this step is indexing it and what those different words and terminologies meant as well. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a really good point. I think using the command line can sometimes help um, kind of force you to, to really understand the program and the different components and how it runs. Okay, so we don't have any more questions coming in at the moment. So I think we might wrap it up there for today. So thank you very much, Paris. That was a really great talk and a good introduction to command line bioinformatics and some of the things that you need to think about before you take that big step in and dive right in. So before we close today, I just have a couple more things to tell everybody. So you can give me a moment. I'll just take the screen share back. So firstly, uh, coming up, we have two more Getting Started webinars. The first one is on Getting Started with Deep Learning, which will be on the 21st of July. And then we also have one on Getting Started with R, which will be on the 16th of August. Now the details of both of those webinars are on the Biocommons website under the events tab, and you can sign up and register for those now. So thank you again, Paris, and thank you to everybody in the audience for joining us as well. Finally, I would like to acknowledge that Australian Biocommons is enabled by ANCRIS via Bioplatforms Australia funding. Thanks again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your days at day, and we hope to see you in another webinar again soon. Bye for now.